welcome to start sharing your screen. Uh, so uh, people can hear me okay? We can also hear you. So floor okay. is yours. Okay, good. So um, I want to tell you about Schrodinger cat state spectroscopy. And uh, the reason for calling these, these uh, methodologies Schrodinger cat spectroscopies is that they really exemplify the coherent and entanglement attributes of the fully and partially coherent CMDS methods that we all know and love. So what's the difference between fully and partially coherent CMDS? Well, uh, in Schrodinger's cat, uh, we know that the cat can be alive or dead and uh, it's in this superposition state uh, where it's simultaneously alive and dead. And we don't know what it is until we open the box. At that point, the superposition state collapses and we perform our measurement. So fully coherent uh, spe uh, spectroscopies are where you don't open the box until later. Uh, partially are where you open the box halfway through, take a look in, close the box and uh, let the uh, experiment continue to evolve. So my goal in using this cat state description is to broaden your understanding of our field, CMDS. And the reason for that is that you all are the future of coherent multidimensional spectroscopy. And uh, you're going to be important in defining how broadly applicable this is going to be for the world. Now, the Schrodinger cat is just uh, an example of a single uh, cat that is in a superposition state. But of course, we can extend that and create cat states that have many, many more states. For example, we can put a dog in the box and then we have uh, the dog either being alive or dead and the cat being alive or dead. Uh, so we can entangle lots of different states to create our Schrodinger cat state. You know, you know, quantum computing is really hot these days and uh, quantum computing really is aiming to try to have something like 50 entangled states. And uh, so this is really at the heart of everything that we know and love, okay? So, okay, so going way back, this all started with Charlo and Pound's paper that basically said uh, that we could create the optical analog of NMR using lasers. Uh, at the time, I was a, uh, just entering uh, college as a uh, student, and uh, this was really exciting. Uh, there was great excitement and great promise because having an optical analog of NMR uh, could be really uh, uh, very earth-shaking uh, 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 advance because we know how strongly uh, capable NMR is. And so we would expect to have the same kind of thing if we have an optical analog. So I would say that the field of CMDS is really the final realization of this promise of having an optical analog to NMR. So we know that uh, spectroscopic methods are really ubiquitous in science and technology. We have UV visible, fluorescence, infrared, Raman spectroscopies, and uh, these are used extensively in the real world. But we also know that CMDS methods are even more powerful, especially when you're dealing with complex samples. So why shouldn't they also dominate the world and all of science and technology. Well, I'm going to argue that there are some constraints that are preventing us from having this widespread dissemination. First, you need really large transition moments in order to have signals. Uh, 2D IR, for example, really uses carbonyls extensively because they have huge transition moments, but that avoids the fingerprint modes that are actually much more sensitive to the molecular structure. The spectral range itself is really limited. It's not like the spectral range you have in fluorescence or UV visible. It's really excellent for measuring ultra-fast dynamics, but that's all good for measuring the kinds of spectra that most people want to have. 
There's also scattering from the excitation beams that create a background. There's a non-resident background interference that uh, determines what the uh, detection limits are going to be. And there's a really a rather limited family of methods. It's really dominated by stimulated uh, photon echo experiments. NMR, on the other hand, has hundreds of methods. And in addition, the methods that we need are sophisticated and they cost a lot. So I want to uh, look at how we are going to surmount those constraints. Okay, and to do that, I want to look at uh, a Schrodinger cat state. So this is a uh, hydrogen atom and it's 1s state. And I'm going to induce a transition from the 1s state to the 2p state using an electromagnetic field indicated by the arrows that you see there. And what that's going to do is that electric field is going to push and tug on that 1s wave function and distort it. And it's going to become more and more distorted as this electromagnetic field feeds coherence of the 1s state and mixes it with the 2p state. So as we go along, we'll get more and more 2p character until it's finally all 2p character. So here we go. You can see it oscillating along. This is the Rabi cycle. So here we are in the 2p state, that's a population, but we haven't lost the coherence and it goes back down to the ground state. And it just keeps doing this as the, uh, the Rabi oscillations. Okay, so this is what's really going on when light goes through windows, for example, the light is inducing this cat state, this mixture of 1s and 2p character, and allows light to go through windows and so on. Now, we do experiments where we have multiple pulses coming in. And so we can create additional states. This is a two state system. But, uh, but uh, we can also bring in additional lasers to create additional states and add them to our Schrodinger cat state. So rather than having this very simple oscillation, we can have much more complex oscillations at all of the frequency combinations of the states that make up the Schrodinger cat state, okay? So NMR works on the basis of having pi over two pulses. And what does a pi over two pulse do? Well, it starts feeding coherence and mixture of states until we get to a 50-50 mixture of the states. So now we have the largest coherence amplitude that we can have. And this is then turned off. We turn off the pulse at that point and watch the free induction decay. And then something like COSY brings in another pi over two pulse, creates another coherence, you measure the phase oscillations of that, and so on. I just want to point out that there's two ways of being able to do NMR. Uh, when it was first discovered, it was done by scanning the frequency of the radio frequency excitation and watching resonances with the nuclei. But then uh, Fourier transform uh, uh, NMR took over and there they were measuring the phase oscillations of the, uh, the coherences. And the same thing has happened in our field of CMDS. The first experiments were ones where it was frequency domain. And then it was taken over by using time domain, like Nisha has just talked with us about, where you have a local oscillator that you overlap with the signal in order to resolve the phase oscillations. So, uh, so rather than using pi over two pulses, we use phase matching do the same kinds of things in order to create what is essentially a pi over two pulse. But in actuality, it's not really a pi over two pulse. What it's actually doing, you have a femtosecond pulse, it is starting up the evolution of this uh, coherence, but then you stop. You don't have a 50-50 mixture, you have a rather low amplitude coherence, and that's the one that you're going to be measuring. And that's at the heart of what I'm going to be telling you about. The size of the coherence is really determined by the pulse width of the excitation that you're creating. Okay, so here's the typical experiments that we all do. We bring in three pulses, they uh, excite these coherences, creating this, oops, 
creating this uh, cat state that we have here, a mixture of the ground state with three other states that we can excite with these pulses. And uh, these, uh, this is a cat state that collapses. And when it collapses, it's going to give out a photon shown here. And the states that we have are entangled with each other. And they're also entangled with all the photons that are coming in and the photon that's going out. And this entanglement means that when the cat state collapses, you make a measurement. And that measurement is going to tell you how it collapsed. It could create a photon that corresponds to the difference between these two states or between these two states. The relative importance is going to deter be determined by the amplitude of being in each of these states. So we'll get out a photon that'll be corresponding to one of these frequency combinations and uh, we'll measure it. And that'll tell us what the cat state collapsed into. But in addition, we can measure all of these other signals coming out because they are entangled with the cat state that was with the uh, output that was measured here. So these other photons can be measured at a much later time, but they're going to then be determined by the fact that you've already made your measurement. That's the secret of entanglement. So that you know some of them will lose a photon, some of them will gain a photon. But together, they're going to conserve momentum and energy. And this is how uh, we do our spectroscopy. OK, so I said that there's both frequency and time domain methods. And I said the frequency domain methods came first but then became dominated by time domain methods. But there's still groups in the world that are doing frequency domain methods. So we're still doing them. Paul Donaldson at the Central Laser Facility in uh, England is gonna be talking uh, next time about his beautiful work. So I'm going to uh, let you listen to what he has to say about these methodologies, but he's done some really nice research. David Klug's group at Imperial College and Peter Chen's group at Spelman College. So I'm gonna show you some beautiful spectra that, uh, that uh, were taken in, uh, in Klug's group. These, this is a spectrum of a protein, a target protein for a drug. So this is the spectrum of the drug bound to the protein. So there's like 200 different features in this spectrum. This is all taken by, pre, by uh, scanning the frequencies of these excitation pulses and watching how bright the output is. So you're scanning it across all of these various resonances. So some of the peaks correspond to the protein, some correspond to the drug, but there's also cross peaks that come from the binding between the drug and the protein. So they really are identifying what people are really interested in and seeing how, whether a drug binds to a protein or not. These are uh, examples of Peter Chen's work. This is a uh, spectrum of different isotopes of bromine in the gas phase. And if you look at the normal absorption spectrum, it's just big, broad, and ugly. You can't resolve anything. But if you do the 2D spectrum using this kind of methodology, you get a beautiful spectrum that isolates all of the rho vibronic states, as well as the uh, different isotopes from each other. So uh, you can see from both of these examples that you have great selectivity and that you can do these uh, experiments over wide ranges of frequencies. It really just depends upon how broad a band the frequencies that you can create. Okay, so there's lots of ways of doing Schrodinger cat state spectroscopy. And uh, this just shows some of them. Uh, so we saw uh, a beautiful talk by Misha just a second ago, where he excites two different states and then uh, uh, measures the output that's coming out. And, uh, and he did his in the time domain, but there's no reason why you can't use the frequency domain. So you would scan this laser over this particular uh, state this laser over that state, and uh, even scanning across an electronic state if there is one. Otherwise, it would be a virtual state. So there's all sorts of different ways of creating the Schrodinger cat state. So these are all methods, just like uh, NMR has lots of methods. This is the family of CMDS methods. And these are all fully coherent. There's no intermediate population in any of them. And as such, 
they are instantaneous fingerprints of the states that exist at the time that you bring all of these pulses together. And there's no population dynamics that get in the way because if there is population dynamics, well, that collapses the Schrodinger cat state. Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna compare all of these different methodologies that we all know and love. So pump probe, 2D IR, 2D electronic spectroscopy, photon echo, stimulated photon echo. You can either do these by creating a population at a partially coherent pathway and then probing that population, uh, or you can create a coherence with two different vibrational states and then probe that. So this would be a fully coherent method. And these are all fully coherent methods that uh, you can use to look at uh, combinations of uh, vibrational modes. So here we're exciting one vibrational mode, a combination band, and then we have a transition to the electronic state and an output. And notice that this output is at a different frequency than any of the inputs. So you don't have to worry about uh, scattering from other excitation pulses because this is spectrally isolated from all of the rest. So there's lots of ways of being able to do these experiments and they all have their own particular capabilities. So what I want to do is I want to look at how large the output signal is from all of these different methods so that we can compare them. And in particular, I'd like to identify why can't we see fingerprint modes in most 2D IR experiments? Why are we stuck with carbonyl groups? Well, what we need to do is to solve the Louisville equation. Here's our Schrodinger cat state, some superposition state of all of my different wave functions. Uh, this is going to create then a density function, a density matrix that tells me the product of the amplitudes for being in the N and M states. So this coherence is going to tell me how big my signal is going to be. So Louisville equation says that I can start out with a coherence between states K and J, or I can start out with a coherence be between states I and K. And the electromagnetic field given here is going to create a Rabi frequency, a Rabi uh, 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 cycle that corresponds to this uh, Rabi, uh, uh, amplitude of the Rabi frequency. And it's going to cause a transition. So K, K may be excited to K, uh, state I. So the KJ coherence becomes an IJ coherence. Or we can take uh, state I, the coherence IK and change that K into a J. So that would be a transition where this state K goes down to J. So these are called either Brassi transitions, or sorry, Ketsi transitions or Brassi transitions. Okay. And I have a uh, factor here that tells what the frequency of the IJ coherence is going to be and how fast the IJ coherence disappears because of dephasing. Now I can solve the Louisville equation just by using a step function excitation. So it turns on and stays on. And then I can take the Laplace transform of the, Laplace, of the uh, uh, Louisville equation, and that's it. Then I can do the inverse Laplace transform and solve for the final output coherence, rho ij. And what I see is I get this kind of equation. So I look at that equation in more depth. I have this term, which says, well, there may be an initial population of this final coherence. And that's going to be oscillating in time and decaying in time. So this is the free induction decay that occurs after you turn off an excitation pulse. And then I have four terms here. And each of these terms has a resonant denominator. And if state i is higher than state k, then omega ik is positive, And omega is the frequency of my excitation. So when those become resonant with each other, that goes to zero, and I get a large output. Okay, so this is basically describing absorption. This term, on the other hand, is describing stimulated emission. This will have resonance when omega ik is negative. So this is where 
state K is higher than state I, and I get emission. And then same thing can be said for the other kind of coherence where we have a bra side transition and we get absorption and we get stimulated emission from that. So we can use these equations then to follow through all of the different interactions that are occurring in a CMDS experiment. So pre-induction decay, this term right here is describing the transient buildup as the Rabi frequency drives the transition. And this, uh, this term describes the steady state. So we have a transient that goes up to the steady state and then this term really takes over. This has the dephasing rate in it that kills off that at longer times. Now, if I go on resonance, so this term goes to zero, and if my original coherence, this one, is not a coherence, it's a population, then I don't have to worry about it dephasing because it's a population, it's just sitting there. So that term will go to zero if it's a population, but it won't if it's a coherence. So here's the condition for resonance if I have a coherence initially, and here's the one that I have for a population. And notice that the relationship between the initial and final coherences depends upon the ratio of the uh, um, of this Rabi frequency term to the dephasing rate. Okay, so this is how fast the, uh, uh, the coherence is going to build up and this is how fast it's going to decay and it depends on that ratio. The other thing that's important is this factor, one minus e to the minus gamma t because this is describing how much of an amplitude you've allowed it to build up over this time t. So if t is very short, this is gonna be a small number. And if it's long, it can reach steady state. Okay, so here are the three, the four different things that I wanna talk about. I can be in the impulsive regime where I have a very short pulse. I build up my coherence, small pre-induction decay. I can also have a much longer pulse. So the, uh, this is all assuming I start in a population. The uh, coherence builds up, reaches steady state. Then I turn off the pulse and I get pre-induction decay. So this is what I get in the CW limit. But I can also be in the mixed domain. And here's where I allow it to build up, but then turn it off before it reaches steady state and I get the pre-induction decay. And this is what happens if the initial uh, coherence is a coherence. So it defaces as well as the final coherence. So here I'll build it up to some amplitude and then it starts to decay away before the excitation pulse even disappears. So this is the limit in which femtosecond CMDS is done. This is the limit in which frequency domain spectroscopy is done. And these are the limits where you have mixed domain. The spectra are obtained by scanning the frequencies, but the pulses are also short enough so that you can uh, get dynamical information, okay? So that's what happens with a single pulse. But of course, we have multiple pulses. So here's a pulse that comes in, builds up a coherence, turn it off, we get pre-induction decay, but then we intercept it with another pulse that turns on, builds up a, 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 a um, coherence amplitude and turn it off before it disappears and then bring in another pulse in order to uh, create the output. And so this is going to be giving us the output that we're actually measuring, okay? So now we're gonna do that for four different cases. I wanna compare carbonyl modes, those are these guys, and fingerprint modes, that's these guys. And I wanna do it for a uh, one picosecond excitation pulse. So here are the pulses that are coming in, they're one picosecond for both this one and this one. And here are the pulses coming in for my femtosecond experiment for both the fingerprint and the carbonyl mode, okay? And so here's a table. Uh, I'll let you uh, look at this in more detail when the, uh, this uh, video is actually posted, but I'll lead you through some of it. This is where we're going to calculate the size of the final coherence that we get from some initial coherence. And I'm going to assume 
that the intensity is always 10 to the 10th watts, regardless of the experiment that you're doing. And why did I pick that? Well, you want as high a um, intensity as you can get in order to get a big signal. But you don't want it to get so high that you damage your sample. And so 10 to the 10th watts per square centimeter is kind of typical of the experiments that we all do. Here's what happens with a one picosecond pulse. Here's what happens with a 35 femtosecond pulse for both carbonyl and fingerprints. Uh, I'm going to the typical transition moment for a carbonyl transition is 0.3 dBi. For a typical fingerprint, it's like a hundredth of a dBi. Dephasing rate for a fingerprint mode is about a picosecond. For a carbonyl, it's a little shorter than a, a picosecond. So the ratio of the uh, Rabi uh, rate to the uh, dephasing rates, that ratio is determining the relative size of the initial and final coherences relative to each other. So for carbonyl, we build up to about 43% of, uh, of the uh, at ratio. And for a fingerprint, it's only about 4%. Uh, here is this factor that's determining how close to steady state we are. Here with the carbonyl mode, we're pretty close to being in steady state with a one picosecond pulse. With the fingerprint mode, it's more like 63%. So if I look at the uh, calculate using these equations, what the final coherence amplitude is relative to the initial coherence amplitude, I see it's 0.41 for the carbonyl, 0.03 for the fingerprint mode. If I look at the carbonyl, it's 0.04, pretty similar to the fingerprint mode. But the fingerprint mode is down about 0.1%. Uh, uh, and so this really is the reason why fingerprint modes are really difficult to see with a time domain kind of methodology. So this is what you get when you have an initial coherence going to a final coherence. But of course, we're going to have three pulses. So that means that after each of these steps where the amplitude of the coherence that we get is gonna gradually go down more and more and more because each step is going to create a smaller coherence. So this is the amplitude of the first coherence, the amplitude of the population in this case, the amplitude of the last coherence, the output coherence, and if you're interested, this is the ratio of the output electromagnetic field relative to the input. And if you're doing things with a local oscillator, then this uh, is the line that you would look at. But now this allows us to be able to compare these different uh, cases with each other. You can see that with a one picosecond pulse that you can create amplitudes in the fingerprint region that are comparable to those in the carbonyl for the femtosecond system. Okay, so these are telling us now why, what we would need to do in order to be able to use the fingerprint modes. The answer is just use a longer pulse. Okay, uh, and this is the same kind of thing, but now we are doing this with fully coherent uh, pathways. So this is where we have an intermediate coherence and we get the same kinds of things. I also want to do this for all of these fully coherent pathways, but this is a problem because the excited state, the excited electronic state that's involved in this last transition is often a virtual state. And so we don't have the same kinds of uh, variables, knowledge of the variables that are associated with going to uh, this virtual state. So, uh, uh, we don't know what that is for carbonyls. We don't know what that is for uh, combination bands and uh, uh, the things that are going to be important for this kind of methodology. But Ming Cho did some calculations where for acetonitrile for this particular pathway. And so for this particular pathway for acetonitrile, we do know the values for these all of these transitions. So the particular states that were involved in this calculation were this CN stretch that's here, and then the combination bands that are out here. So you can see these combination bands are really rather weak, and yet the spectra that you get with this kind of methodology, they're really quite strong. So if we use those values, then we can calculate the three different coherences that are involved in this process, and these are the values that you get. 
And so again, uh, these are all values that uh, are quite competitive with the other ones that we've been talking about. And they have the added advantage that the output that we have is coming out in the visible rather than in the infrared. And in the visible, we've got excellent detectors. So you can even go down to fewer than one photon per uh, shot of the laser. Okay, so this is a relationship between all of these methodologies, okay? Now, these are all methodologies that allow you to get spectra over wavelength regions determined only by your lasers and how far they can be scanned. Uh, that doesn't do anything for dynamics. So I wanna also point out that the Schrodinger cat states can be really excellent for looking at dynamics because I said that they are instantaneous snapshots of what the, uh, what the states are, the quantum states are at the moment that you're measuring them. So you can do a pump fully coherent probe where you have a one or two photon pump. And then at a later time, you bring in a fully coherent probe and get a snapshot. So that isolates the dynamics to the, to the uh, time between when the uh, pump went off and when the probe went off. These are experiments that were done in our laboratory just recently. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, Darian Moreau, one of my graduate students, will be able to present uh, those um, results at some future meeting here. Okay, so let's go back and look at uh, how we are going to handle these constraints. Large transition moments, well, we just need longer pulses. Limited spectral range, we need to scan the frequencies. It's excellent for dynamics. Well, this is also excellent for spectroscopy. Scattering, well, you get a different output. Non-resident background, you can get rid of it by having a longer time delay. Limited family of methods, well, I just showed you lots of methods. Sophistication and cost, well, you know, <laughs> those are still uh, costly, but uh, I'm gonna point out that light conversion has created a system for us specifically to be able to get to the case where we have pulses that are long enough to create big amplitude coherences, but short enough that you can discriminate against non-resonant background. So this ytterbium laser that light conversion uh, cells uh, runs at 100 kilohertz, 100 times faster than our current methodologies. And it is so intense that you can pulp three different OPAs with them, uh, two of them to do uh, infrared excitations across that region and uh, visible so you can also entangle uh, electronic states. Okay, so all of the problems are solved. We should be able to have CMDS become a dominant methodology. Okay, so this is my group. This is Dan Kohler and Kent Meyer. They're both scientists in my group. They're former graduate students, some of the best graduate students I've ever had. And Darian Moreau, who's also one of the best graduate students that I ever had, uh, he just graduated and I hope he'll be giving a talk here. Uh, this is the University of Wisconsin's chemistry department where we have our laboratories. And I would like to welcome any of you out there that would like to join our group and, uh, and try to uh, uh, look at how to uh, develop these methodologies. And I want to encourage all of you uh, that the future of CMDS and its widespread dis dissemination is all up to you. And I would really like to thank Thomas and Maxine for all of their work in keeping this uh, uh, CMDS uh, gathering together through this pandemic. So thanks, Thomas and Maxine, and that's it. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, we have a Talk is open for questions. Uh, I, I would like to make a few remarks here. Well, the first remark was concerning this question. Okay, so when when you just began, John, uh, about the Schrodinger cat. Okay, so I thought that uh, you are going to steer toward the question if they seem this field uh, alive or dead. Uh, and, and you know, this is not the kind of question that you would like to ask. Uh, and the second remark is concerning this balance between their 
um, the, the pulse duration and uh, the dynamics of their uh, processes uh, you would like to study. That was a kind of long time ago when we generated extremely short pulses together with Dao Wiers, my and Andres Baltushka. We also aiming at extremely short pulse because we thought, okay, that's a classical delta pulse, right? But together with um, this short pulse, you also begin to excite a lot of things that you don't want to excite. So instead of having air clearly signal, you actually contaminate your signal with all possible, well, complications. And then we learned our lesson that, well, uh, you have to be careful with balancing between the pulse duration and the, uh, well, dynamical process you would like to study. Uh, so, well, that's, uh, these are not actually questions, okay? These are remarks. Yeah, no, these are, these are good remarks, you know. The thing that is really great in NMR is that, uh, you know, your pulses are short compared to the range of frequencies that uh, you look at in NMR. So they, it's easy for them to excite all of the spins just with a, uh, a short pulse. We can't do that with uh, our NMR methods or our CMDS methods because we don't have short enough pulses to create uh, the range of frequencies that we would really like to be able to see. Okay, Arun, uh, you can ask your question live. Just please don't forget to switch on your mic. Or shall I read that then? Okay, so the remark uh, coming from Arun, uh, the signal measurement can, yes. Okay, go ahead. Please. Okay. So, okay, uh, hello, sorry for that. Uh, so the question was that when you, uh, probably in the second slide, when you, Professor Wright mentioned about the projective measurements, uh, the polarization is related to the off-diagonals. If we interpret it into the H0 basis, the field-free eigenbasis of the H0. Okay. Uh, and the projective measurements will always have a right, like P dagger, observable P, this kind of operation mathematically, which will bring us from diagonal to diagonal. So I was curious if the polarization that we observe in 2D spectra, if it can be interpreted as a projective measurements. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the polarization is what you are driving with the electromagnetic field. So the polarization is actually a manifestation of the gas state itself. Hello. That makes sense. I, I couldn't hear the last sentence. Maybe the connection was a bit off. Yeah, uh, what I was saying is that uh, the polarization that you're talking about is what is actually responsible for the emission. And uh, that polarization is being driven by the electromagnetic field. And that basically is a cat state. Uh, between the field and the matter. So yeah, as you're driving that polarization, the polarization is also launching its own electromagnetic field. You know, that's basically the uh, reason behind index of refraction is that you're driving a polarization with electromagnetic field and you're doing it coherently. And you get interference between the polarization that's created, that you created, mm -hmm. and the electromagnetic field that the polarization itself creates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, but I was just a little bit confused because the off diagonal of the density operator is not directly related to the measurement process as it is defined in the, let's say, quantum computing that you had referred to in the earlier part of the slide. And that's... Yeah, well, those off, those off diagonal parts are the ones that are describing the coherences. It, it, yes, and but they are not uh, exactly related to each other, so did not directly related to each other, and that's why because uh, one of the I guess uh, probably if we write the uh, our signal expression in the basis in the eigen basis of the dipole operators, the transition dipole operators, then it's much more closer to the uh, projective measurement. Okay. Um, that's the uh, that's what, maybe I can write an email to you <laughs> probably. That would be easier to communicate, I guess. Okay, thanks.
uh, I can ask a question. Uh, yes, and you don't. You, you shouldn't ask for asking the question. Ah, okay. Sorry. Um, so I was just curious. Do you have? Yeah. So you're alluding to that you would like to to do kind of. Or you think that it would be possible to do these uh, same normal type, or maybe normal is not the right thing, but a two D I R type um, experiment on the fingerprint in the fingerprint region. Uh, so, what would your candidate kind of molecules be? What you what you would would be the first kind of experiment to to start to do? Yeah, what would I you mean, be looking at? Yeah, there they'd be rather simple experiments. It's what we call TRIV, triply uh, vibrationally uh, resonant four way mixing. So we did a number of experiments doing exactly that, and the, the only difference is that you're using uh, longer pulses, picosecond pulses in that case. So yeah, we did, a, we did a lot of work in just doing normal, uh, what, what the same pathways that 2D IR uses, we use those for this method that we call TRIF because it was the frequency domain analog. You know, but uh, all of the things that uh, are done by uh, current methods can be done in the frequency domain. Uh, for example, Misha did some of these beautiful experiments where uh, he excited, uh, the uh, low frequency mode, a higher frequency mode, and got an output coming out in the visible, uh, and then de developed a local oscillator so I could see the phase oscillations. Well, equally well, Misha could just change the frequency of those excitation pulses and measure the output intensity. And uh, you get exactly the same information. But you wouldn't have to have a local oscillator. Okay. And the, the kind of dynamics that you think would be useful to study? Because yeah. you would need something that is, well, slower if your time resolution is lower, right? So. Yeah, that, I mean, there's always this compromise between measuring spectra and measuring dynamics. And, you know, so you're, when you're operating in this mixed domain, you can do both of those things, but it's more complicated because they're influencing each other. So you really have to do some theory, which uh, people like you are really good at, to be able to extract out what the dynamics are relative to the spectroscopy. But what I'm also saying is that you can get it out more directly by doing a pump fully coherent probe, because that then isolates the dynamics and uh, you can see these things much more easily. Okay, thank you. The other questions? Chris Cheatham, you must have a question. <laughs> you always ask questions in my, my class. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Hello, John. Uh, so sure, I have a question. Um, this you've been you've been you've been developing these tools uh, as a, a kind of analytical methodology for a long time that's right uh, uh, and you know you and david and other folks have have shown uh real potential uh for these things to be applied in an analytical setting i'm wondering what the killer app is right so you've been developing these things where's the place where where we're going to be able to apply this and really kind of turn the corner from potential to to true killer application yeah, oh, excellent question. I didn't even plant that with you. <laughs> I think that this uh, system that I showed you from light conversion is really the key because the problem with time uh, with frequency domain experiments is that ultra fast lasers were not meant to be scanned in frequency. They were meant to go to a particular frequency and sit there and get dynamics. And so it has been a real problem getting all of the artifacts ringed out in scanning these ultra fast lasers. And light conversion now has a system where all of those things that changed when you change the frequencies, they don't change the pointing and, uh, and uh, temporal position of these uh, pulses. And so that means that this kind of methodology is really going to be a lot easier to use. And that's why I think we are 
on the brink of being able to make this methodology much more universal. You should try it out. Uh, yeah, so what's the thing you're going to probe though, right? I, 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 yeah, it, indeed, it looks like you've got the right tools. Yeah. Um, but what are you going to measure? I want to probe chemical reactions, right? Chemical reactions happen because you have some bond that's being stretched or wiggled and uh, that's affecting the electronic state. So the electronic states move up and down. And when they move up or down just enough, you get a reaction to happen. So the reaction surface itself are these vibrational modes. So we can excite two vibrational modes. If they're on the reaction surface, then they're gonna be coupled and they're also gonna be coupled to the electronic states. And we can do all of the vibrational and electronic states so that we can identify exactly what the reaction surface looks like in the ground state, not having to send it to an excited state. Does that make sense? That sounds cool. Yeah, so cobalamin is a uh, great thing that we are working on right now. And in cobalamin, you have this uh, cobalt that is uh, surrounded by these uh, ligands. And uh, for some reason, when something bonds, uh, you break the carbon cobalt bond that, uh, that uh, rate constant increases by 13 orders of magnitude just because something comes into this uh, system. And that means that there's some vibrational modes that are affecting electronic modes and we are looking to identify what those are. So that's just an example of the many things you can do, but more obvious examples are looking at complex materials where uh, the regular spectra is just so broad you can't distinguish anything. But uh, if these methodologies, you can get in there and dissect the spectrum into all its component parts. Very exciting. I look forward. I look forward to seeing Thanks it. Thanks for the question, Chris. <laughs> okay, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so with that, I am then stopping this recording. <laughs>